I felt was very important for me too was Vick's hypothesis that he did in 1981. It was a, quite a rudimentary hypothesis, but it, for me it was very, very useful. And this, in this hypothesis, he talked about the fact that there's a transition of people who were impaired to becoming disabled. And this was a product of the program of capitalism. He argued that, you know, under feudalism, disabled people were part of the family unit, and that family unit was the economic unit. It was more easily adaptable to the individuals within it. But when you got industrialization, two things happened. You got centralization of work and standardization of methods of production. And people who were non-standard didn't fit into it so easily. And so they got excluded, they couldn't get, get work. And they also the families had to move to the work um, and people got separated from their families. So then you got destitution and begging. And in that period, just the, the people who had been impaired really became disabled um, by the transition into industrial society. And that is when charities come in and start setting up institutions to take care of people. The Disabled People's Movement was one of the most significant social movements of the 20th century in Britain. At its heights in the 1980s, the movement's main organisation, the British Council of Organisations of Disabled People, had around half a million members. The fierce resistance it gave to the system of segregation, which disabled people were subject to in Britain, profoundly shaped policy and provided substantial victories concretely improving the lives of disabled people. Its radical wing, organised through the Union of the Physically Impaired Against Segregation, or UPIUS, not only played a major role in the movement, but also shaped disability theory worldwide, developing the social model of disability under the leadership of Paul Hunt and Vic Finkelstein. Despite these enormous achievements, the movement's history has been all but entirely erased. Only two activist histories published on the subject, 23 years apart. In her book, No Limits, activist and historian of the movement, Judy Hunt, breaks the movement's development down into five phases. First obvious phase was the period when segregation became like a, a flood floodgate event segregation, segregated facilities. That was really the 50s and 60s, um, it was happening. You know, you saw a massive expansion of, of institutions, of, you know, of sheltered workshops, of special transport, of special education, of um, day centres, so leisure, of sport, you know, everything. It was like a whole, whole separate development which looked extremely like apartheid you know it was it were and people were actually referring some people were referring to as apartheid the modern care sector in britain finds its origins in the aftermath of the second world war in contrast to the workhouses of the 19th century where disabled people were compelled to work for a pittance and the trend of hospitalisation seen in the first half of the 20th century, which saw many young disabled people confined to so-called geriatric wards intended for the elderly and dying. The period following the wars saw an enormous growth in specialised facilities for the disabled. With the impetus given by the National Assistance Act of 1948, which gave local authorities the power to set up limited welfare services, and a small number of care homes for the elderly, and the establishment of the National Health Service in 1950. But state support for facilities lacking, the voluntary sector took the lead in this process. The two dominant providers being Cheshire Homes and the Spastic Society, today renamed Scope. Although in practice only a minority of disabled people have ever been forced into such institutions, their importance in the history of disabled people's struggle is marked. 
The organisation of these facilities both revealed the nature of disabled people's oppression, with residents unable to exercise control over their own lives and segregated from the mass of society, and provided a basis for struggle as diverse communities of disabled people were brought together. With this in mind, it is unsurprising that the first Cheshire home in Britain, Le Court, was also home to some of the disabled people's movement's foundational struggles. It was whilst working in this institution that Judy Hunt met one of the leading figures of the disabled people's movement and her husband, Paul Hunt. And I was very impressed by this man, a uh, very attractive man. We formed a friendship and then ultimately a relationship. And for me, that was a very steep learning curve. Paul was a few years older than me, got a bit more life experience through the things he'd gone through. He was a committed representative of the residents, often the chair of their residence committee, a great reader, a great writer. He was actually passionate about injustice and inequality. These disabled people in, in particular, but uh, the, you know, the struggles that black people were going through against race, racial prejudice, and in fact, any disadvantaged group. So I was learning a lot. Paul Hunt's struggles with the residents at Lee Court would prove instrumental in forming the politics of the movement's radical wing. The central thrust of these struggles was for residents to gain control over their own care and to argue for freedom from the institution, independence and integration into the wider community. Over the 50s and 60s, residents organised in a committee to combat restrictions on bedtimes, getting up times, their freedoms to go out, drink alcohol and a host of other arbitrary impositions. In the Cheshire Smile, the Cheshire Foundation's official monthly journal, established by Le Court residents in 1954 and edited by them for a considerable period. The lessons of these struggles were drawn, and an understanding of disabled people's oppression began to form. As indicated by a campaign beginning in 1958 against being called patients, a central lesson of this period was the role of medicalisation in the formation of resident oppression. Another key struggle against the expulsion of Peter Wade another residence committee chair from the court in 1962 highlighted the lack of services to support disabled people in the community. These lessons and others discussed in No Limits would stay with Paul Hunt as he moved out of Le Court and began to engage with the gathering grassroots movement outside of institutions. Phase two, as we go into the 60s up to 1970, what you see is actually an expansion of responses to that segregation and exclusion from the mainstream. So there are campaigns around starting up about poverty, about um, mobility, those are the two big ones. But there were, all, there, there were a whole range of groups are reacting to um, this exclusion from society and beginning agitation also around around um, segregation from education as well. That was a big, another big branch of it. So it ends with 1970 when you get the Chronically Sick and Disabled Persons Act, which actually is like a, a, a response to a popular a movement. It's a very significant popular movement with large numbers of disabled people involved, as well as their allies and relatives. So. It, it, it was a broad, broad base of, of, of struggle going on then. Then phase three is really from 1970 to 1980. We felt that the, at that period, what we saw with the um, Social Services Act was a real consolidation of the welfare services. And then there was corresponding reaction by disabled people to suddenly what they're getting. You know, it's not this liberating <laughs> opening up a society, but actually now they're under the power and authority of an awful lot of professionals determining, prescribing, determining what they could and couldn't do. And it's during that period that a small radical tendency emerges. In 1971, Paul and I uh, went to the inaugural conference of something called the Association of Disabled Professionals. 
it was really taking up the whole issue of disabled people's education and employment. By chance, met up with Rick and Liz Finkelstein. There's Rick in the audience and Paul in the audience, and we sort of all came together. And immediately, there was a very strong um, connection between Paul and Rick. From then onwards, we had some very intense discussions and a very rapid radicalization happened because Paul and Vic were mutually complementary. Vic and Liz had come from South Africa. Vic had been involved in the struggle against apartheid and had in fact been a political prisoner there. And he came over, he was, you know, pretty, I don't know, in a pretty depressed state actually at, the, at that time. But he didn't know anything about disability in the UK. And Paul had this very large knowledge of what was going on around disability in the UK, but it didn't have the experience of um, being involved in a revolutionary political movement as Vic had had. So the combination of their knowledges was very powerful. They both could learn a huge amount from each other. In due course, Paul felt he needed to take things forward in, in the UK. He's been thinking for a long time about the need for disabled people to have a, uh, their own uh, democratic organisation run by themselves. And he wrote a letter to The Guardian inviting people to join him, which subsequently became Union of the Physically Impaired Against Segregation. The grassroots movement of the 1960s, organised in a number of different campaigning organisations, was fundamentally what gave the impulse for the formation of UPS. The organisations of this period included both disabled people and care professionals, producing frequent conflicts of interest. The resulting Chronically Sick and Disabled Persons Act of 1970 clearly showed the limits of this, adopting a medical approach and not including even any recommendations for services to integrate disabled people into the community. The need for disabled people to run their own organisations and to develop a model of disability in combat with the medical view was clear. Under Paul Hunt and Vic Finkelstein's leadership, the union led the way, arguing for a clear distinction between impairment and disability. Disability, they argued, in a number of circulars, was a form of social oppression. Particularly with the rise in technical aids, there was no reason why disabled people should not be able to be fully integrated into society. The segregation, exclusion and poor living conditions that disabled people faced were therefore imposed by the social structure of capitalist society. This became known as the social model of disability. In gaining this understanding, UPS set itself a revolutionary goal to end the use of all segregated facilities and to replace them with support to integrate disabled people into broader society, granting them the same freedoms as others. Both the process of producing this concept and the pursuit of this objective involved considerable struggle. Because there were people who were members in institutions, they couldn't meet. So they did it through a written format. So it was all written down, a lot of it. They also had to be mindful of the situation of people in institutions who, if they were exploring actually very radical, very explosive ideas, very critical of the authorities, they needed to protect them from exposure. So it had to be confidential. And it was in the course of that, that learning developed very fast. I mean, it was really quite fiery arguments going on between people. And they also started taking up struggles with the Cheshire people at the Cheshire Foundation in writing, in, letter, in correspondence about the situation of disabled residents. And they were, of course, they didn't know how big this union was. They had no idea how powerful this organisation was. They hadn't, you know, because um, the letters were extremely powerful. <laughs> So once they got their theories together, then they started trying to apply them in practical projects. So you had, particularly in Derbyshire going on, you know, the um, development of various initiatives around housing and so on, and information service. And, um, and, the, and in Manchester, there was another core group 
Um, there was another four group in London trying to stop them building another institution. And so there was, you know, quite a lot of engagement with campaigns going on to take those ideas forward. And then the fourth phase was 1981 to 1986, which is when disabled people seek self-representation and create alternative services. So you get the BCODP, you get the Disabled Peoples International, but the, the link between Britain and uh, elsewhere, and then the growth of um, independent living movement and alternative services. And that's when the, 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 the social movement really takes off. The social movement organised in the British Council of Organisations of Disabled People, founded by all national groups constitutionally controlled by disabled people in Britain following a call from UPIUS in 1981, engaged in an enormous amount of campaigning and practical work. Most fundamental for the movement's development in this process were the organisation of services controlled by disabled people through the independent living movement. However, this approach was not unified, containing two broad tendencies. The first tendency, led by UPIUS, organised centres for integrated living on the principle that socialised services were the fairest way to provide help across society and that disabled people must have a democratic say in how resources were spent and services organised in order to be integrated into society. This was typified by the approach taken in Derbyshire and the London Borough of Lambeth, where partnerships were established with local authorities and then centres for integrated living established to develop new approaches to service provision. The second tendency, led by the Liberation Network of People with Disabilities, organised centres for independent living, taking its cue from the movement in the US. Rather than attempting to gain power over state-provided services, this approach saw disabled people establish their own services, in order that they could then employ their own personal help. The division between these two approaches was not immediately evident, but represented a fundamental difference of approach. The first tendency, that of integrated living, was rooted in an understanding of the need for universalised services and class politics. The second tendency, that of independent living, prioritised control over services at the expense of this universalism and represented a civil rights approach to disabled liberation. As the coming decade would show, this latter approach was not antithetical to a market approach to care. And the final phase starts 1986 and goes beyond that. And that's when you get the grassroots movement moving into a civil rights movement and much more about individual freedom. And this is the period of um, Thatcher's Britain. Um, so it is a changing social social world then. So there's much more of a struggle for it, uh, sort of, uh, personal freedom, equality, growth of a disability culture, lots of arts movements, and of course the independent living movement really takes off during this period. And then you come up to 1990, you come get the Community Care Act, which has a lot of rhetoric which seems to promise some of the things that people are asking for. But actually, hidden within it, actually, is all seeds for, for the destruction of uh, universal services. The turn of the disabled people's movement toward a civil rights approach in Britain came at the same time as the neoliberal assault on state welfare. The combination of these factors would, ultimately, secure the end of the movement. The market in services introduced by the NHS and Community Care Act of 1990 saw centres for integrated living on the decline, the result of competition with privately provided services and a decline in local authority funding. As these market imperatives further developed, the approach of those organising centres for independent living and the notion that disabled liberation lay in civil rights and the ability of disabled people to pay for their services won out. This civil rights approach, though well-intentioned, undertook to provide a legal and market resolution to the problem of disabled people's oppression, rather than one rooted in universalism and common ownership 
under the state. It mobilized a considerable mass of disabled people in direct action and protest through the 1990s, leading to the Disability Discrimination Act of 1995 and the institution of direct payments, a benefit for the purchase of services, in 1996. Whilst still an enormous achievement, this settlement ultimately led to the formation of a considerable market in disabled people's care provision, and subsequently an enormous erosion of the still limited control over service provision won by the movement and particularly its radical wing. Though the market may appear to offer freedom of choice over service provision and control in this sense, in reality the type of service and its deployment are decisions it cannot and will never offer disabled people control over. As Vic Finkelstein saw in his analysis of the creation of the social oppression of disability, the capitalist market standardises, thus abstracting from concrete need. One may only purchase different types of inadequate provision. As the experience of austerity over the 2010s and the naked slaughter of the COVID-19 pandemic have further shown, having converted disabled people into the purchasers of limited freedoms, capital is again tightening the purse strings, resulting in mass abandonment, destitution, segregation and death. The lessons are clear. The fight against segregation and disability again looms heavy. There's probably more action going on out here than there is in the Commons Chamber. There's been a protest by a number of disability protesters here sorry, inside Central Lobby here because moment. of their sorry, anger. We're going to have to stop. We're going to have to stop. We can't film with this guy. We're not allowed to film this. Why not? Well, the government had an idea and Parliament made it law. They say disabled people can't live independently anymore. Which side are you on, my boy? Which side are you on? Which side are you on, the boys? Or which side are you on? They say that we're a burden. They say we're on the ground. Say our life's not worth living. Then they stick us in heaven's waiting lounge. Which side are you on, the boys? Which side are you on? Which side are you on, the boys? Which side are you on? Well, they've given us our own minister. He's supposed to fight the cause. But every time that we ask him, he sticks in another capability clause. Which side are you on, the boys? Which side are you on? Which side are you on, the boys? Which side are you on? Because of all these changes, thousands of us have died. And if these changes keep on happening, what more proof do we need that you have lied? Which side are you on, the boys? Or which side are you on? Or which side are you on, the boys? Or which side are you on? Well, the government had an idea and Parliament made it law. They say disabled people can't live independently anymore. Which side are you on, my boy? Which side are you on? Which side are you on, my boys? Which side are you on? Which side are you on, my boys? Which side are you on? Which side are you on? Boys, which side are you on? Which side are you on, the boys? Which side are you on? Which side are you on, the boys? Which side are you on? Which side are you on, the boys? Oh, which side are you on? Which side are you on, the boys? Oh, which side are you on?